Hello, I'm Esther Gidu Ewart. It's Thursday, March 2nd. This is Africa 54. Nigerian residents voiced their criticism of an election process marred by technological failures and allegations of fraud. French President Emmanuel Macron starts a four-nation tour of Africa in Gabon. And Lord Mark Malok Brown discusses Russia's war in Ukraine with Straight Talk Africa's Heidi Adams. All this and much more coming up on Africa 54. We begin our broadcast in West Africa where Nigeria's ruling party candidate Bola Tinubu was declared the winner of the presidential election Wednesday. But across the country, residents have voiced their criticism of a progress, a process rather marred by technological failures and allegations of fraud. David Doyle has more. It was very, very poor. Very, very poor. Very, very poor. Nigerians from across the country were reacting on Wednesday after ruling party candidate Bola Tinubu was declared president-elect. Speaking then was Chika Ene, a resident of Yola in Nigeria's east. Their work is completely poor. He was voicing widespread concerns over an election that has been dogged by problems such as the failure of new technology, as well as allegations from opposition parties of fraud. Criticism of the vote could also be found in the northern city, Kano. This is businessman Salihu Ibrahim. Most of the people, including me, we are not happy because the election is not pretty unfair. He said something like rigging has taken place in parts of Nigeria and that many people are calling on the chairman of the Electoral Commission to redo the vote. The Independent National Electoral Commission, or INEC, has said it takes full responsibility for the problems, which have been criticised by observer missions. However, it has also rejected allegations from the two main opposition parties that results were heavily doctored and manipulated. It said there are laid down procedures for aggrieved parties or candidates if they are dissatisfied with the outcome. On Wednesday, the Labour Party, whose candidate Peter Obi had galvanised young and urban voters, said it would mount a legal challenge. In Orca, the capital of southeastern Anambra state, trader Mercy Effiong says she also doesn't have faith in INEC's announcement. But the eyes of God, the man is not a winner. Tanubu has urged citizens to unite around him as he defended what he called a credible election that he said gave him a serious mandate. But the bitter dispute has raised fears of violence in a country with a long history of post-election bloodshed. We want justice here in Nigeria. We want democracy here in Nigeria. In Orca, auto rickshaw driver Chinedu Chukwanata said Nigerians want their voices to be heard. We don't care. Fellow driver Obiora Godwin said there will surely be a reaction to this outcome and that they should get ready to face it. David Doyle of Reuters filed that report. The United States is weighing in on the Nigerian presidential election. State Department spokesperson Ned Price spoke about the vote. The United States congratulates the people of Nigeria, President-elect Tinubu, and all political leaders following the declaration by Nigeria's Independent National Electoral Commission, or INEC, on the results of the February 25th presidential election. This competitive election represents a new period for Nigerian politics and democracy. We understand that many Nigerians and some of the parties have expressed frustrations about the manner, manner in which the process was conducted and the shortcomings of technical elements that were used for the first time in a presidential election cycle in Nigeria. Nigerians are clearly within their rights to have such concerns and should have high expectations for their electoral, electoral processes. That was U.S. State Department spokesperson Ned Price. 
Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov and U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrived for the group of 20 foreign ministers meeting in New Delhi on Thursday. The Indian Foreign Minister welcomed the leaders for the summit, which is being held days after a meeting of finance chiefs of the bloc, where they wrangled over condemning Russia for the war. However, they failed to reach a consensus on a joint statement and settled instead for a summary document. The New Delhi meeting is being attended by 40 delegations including the Chinese foreign minister. French President Emmanuel Macron has started a four-nation tour of Africa in Gabon. He is also scheduled to visit Angola, Congo, Brazzaville and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Africa 54's Paul Diho has more. Emmanuel Macron began a tour of Central Africa in a diplomatic drive to test a new, more responsible relationship with the continent as anti-French sentiments run high in some former colonies. Macron's trip comes as alarm grows in Paris over Russia's rising influence in French-speaking African countries, joining China, which has been present in the region for some years. Macron, this week in a speech on French-Africa policy, called for a mutual and responsible relationship with a continent of more than 54 countries, including on climate issues. He says the French military is reducing its footprint on the continent in the coming months. The logic is that a model must not be based anymore on military bases like those we have now. So tomorrow, our military presence will be part of bases, schools and academics, which will be jointly managed, still operating with the French staff who remain, but with smaller individual and African teams, and who will be able to welcome if our African partners want it, and in their terms, some other partners. However, a military source and analysts say French army chiefs may be reluctant to do so. France currently has more than 3,000 soldiers deployed in Senegal, Ivory Coast, Gabon and Djibouti, according to official figures. Another 3,000 are in the Sahel region, further north including Niger and Chad. Macron is attending the One Forest Summit on Preserving Forests worldwide, including along the Congo River Basin, covering 1.62 million square kilometers. The forests of Central Africa represent the planet's second largest carbon sink after the Amazon. Central African forests are home to massive biodiversity, including elephants and gorillas. Analysts say the timing of Macron's visit is widely seen as giving a political boost to President Ali Bongo of Gabon in the run-up to presidential elections later this year. After Gabon, he heads to the former Portuguese colony of Angola on Friday. There he said to sign an accord to develop the agriculture sector as part of a drive to enhance French ties with English and Portuguese speaking regions in Africa. He will later head to Congo, Brazzaville and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Paul Ndio, VOA News, Washington. Tunisia's President uh, Kais Saeed announced a crackdown on illegal immigration last week, alleging a plot by political elites to replace native Tunisians with foreigners and using language the African Union denounced as racialized. Migrants are reporting job loss, eviction and abuse in the days since. Fiona Jones reports. Since Tunisia's president, Kaya Saeed, announced a crackdown on illegal immigration, many African migrants say their lives have been completely destabilized. The president recently claimed in a speech that there has been a conspiracy to change the country's racial makeup. It has a name, the Great Replacement Theory, where political elites replace native inhabitants with immigrants who support their political ideology. He ordered security forces to halt illegal immigration and to expel anyone living illegally in Tunisia. Berry by Ali Stephen, an Ivory Coast national, is now afraid to stay in the country. We were kicked out of the house, we live on the streets, and the streets were still attacked. So this morning we came here to the embassy trying to see if they can help us to return home. He is not the only one. Since the speech, social media has been filled with accounts of similar stories by darker-skinned people in Tunisia, 
including migrants, African students and black Tunisians. And last week, hundreds of people took to the streets in capital Tunis to protest against racism. Tunisia's Social Rights Forum, a group that works with migrants, said it had documented hundreds of arbitrary arrests, evictions and violent assaults, including with knives, that police have been slow to respond to. Said's speech was called shocking by the African Union and denounced as racialized. The leader denied racism but doubled down on the idea that there was a plot to change Tunisia's demographics. However, his critics say this crackdown may be a response to concerns over his political support after an ultra-low election turnout. The Social Rights Forum said the campaign aims to create an imaginary enemy for Tunisians to distract them from their basic problems. That was Fiona Jones of Reuters reporting. As Uganda looks to drill its fast oil wells, critics say the government and its French and Chinese partners are damaging the environment and impeding wildlife migration. Halima Thumani reports from Murchison Falls National Park in Uganda. The oil companies, France's Total Energies, the China National Offshore Oil Corporation and Uganda's National Oil Company are assembling machinery for exploration. The sites include the shores of Lake Albert, where the Chinese corporation will drill three oil wells, and Murchison Falls National Park, where the French outfit will drill 16 wells. In a 2018 environmental impact and assessment report, the oil companies identified 32 potential risks to humans and wildlife. Dickens Kamgisha is the chief executive officer of the Africa Institute for Energy Governance. He says approval of oil drilling by Uganda's National Environmental Management Authority, or NEMA, was premature. And they were supposed to come up with clear mitigation plans. And unfortunately, NEMA went ahead to approve that assessment without the mitigations in place. Up to now, we are not sure if you are talking about doing these roads, conducting those, explore, those activities in Machon Falls. In a written response to VOA, NEMA said that only 0.05% of the nearly 4,000 square kilometer Murchison Falls National Park will be used for oil and gas drilling activities. The authorities say that while oil and gas activities may have an impact on the park, adequate mitigation measures to protect biodiversity have been put in place. Total Energies holds the largest share of the joint venture partnership at 56.76% and is currently constructing and assembling an oil rig inside the Murchison Falls Park that is expected to be completed in May. Alex Malay and Sireko, Total Superintendent for Drilling Pads, says the national park and its habitants will not be impacted. We are actually in their territory. So there are several measures that we take. We don't drive fast. We have changed the color of our vehicles to match the environment. They are unintimidating. We have uh, monitors who all the vehicles have vehicle speed monitoring. We have uh, uh, low noise uh, production from our generators and equipment. The Uganda Wildlife Authority says it is closely monitoring oil exploration activities. In terms of biodiversity, we have quite a number of animals. Actually, Matchstone is one of the best parks that we have in Uganda and is highly visited. And so this is a hot spot for most of the animals. You can actually, on one spot, you can even see more than 10 species of animals. So we have ensured that Total and all the other partners ensure that they follow the park rules and regulations. Uganda's crude oil reserves are estimated at 6.5 billion barrels. The drilling projects are tied largely to the proposed East African crude oil pipeline that will transport Uganda's crude to ports in Tanzania. Uganda Tanzania and the oil companies face an end of March deadline to get the necessary five billion dollars in financing for the pipeline. Halima Athmani for VA News, Murchison Falls National Park, Uganda.
We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and all our VOA Africa programs on our website at voafrica.com. Still to come, concerns about the long-term impact of Russia's war in Ukraine dominate discussions at the recent Munich Security Conference in Germany. We'll have a report. In times of change, when the world seems uncertain, and what we hear doesn't reflect what we see, we seek the truth. When we are told only part of the story, we lose trust. In moments of crisis, our dreams, hopes, and wishes for a better tomorrow depend on a free press. At Voice of America, we bring you the stories that people take risks to see. We connect the world and unite it with truth. At Voice of America, we show you the whole picture. In other news, experts say that South Africa's state-owned power utility, ESCOM, is being crippled by debt and beset by corruption scandals that are preventing the company from keeping the power on nationwide. Many South African power stations operating under ESCOM are at least 45 years old and break down frequently. Spain is extending a so-called circular migration program to its first sub-Saharan African country, bringing in at least 100 people from Senegal to work on its farms during the harvest season, according to a government source. And Ghana's finance ministry says that a Chinese delegation has ended a three-day visit to discuss Ghana's request for the restructuring of the $1.9 billion debt it owes China. Ghana is struggling with its worst economic crisis in a generation. The United Nations is providing support to people that continue to be impacted by the conflict in Ethiopia, unrest in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, and tropical cyclone Freddy in Madagascar. VOS Ignatius Ano has the details. In Ethiopia, the UN says the east and southern regions of the nation continue to reel under the impact of devastating drought. UN spokesperson Stefan Dujaric says some of these people are coping with a cholera outbreak. At least 11,000 cases have been recorded. We, along with our partners and the government, uh, launched an appeal for nearly $4 billion to reach more than 20 million people in Ethiopia this year with critical assistance, including food, nutrition support, health services and other vital aid. In northern Ethiopia, the UN noted improvements in access to humanitarian aid after a deal to end hostilities by warring parties. Since mid-November, the global body says it has sent nearly 180,000 tons of food and other aid to Tigray, adding that more than 8.5 million people are now targeted for food assistance across Afar, Amhara and Tigray. In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, clashes between the Congolese army and the M23 rebels continue in the east of the country, according to the United Nations. Dujarik says assisting people coping with Cyclone Freddy is a challenge. In Madagascar, we are also continuing to support the government to help people impacted by Tropical Cyclone Freddy. At least 226,000 people were impacted, including 150,000 who are in need of humanitarian assistance. The number of people displaced by the cyclone has increased to nearly 38,000, according to the authorities. Hundreds of schools have been damaged, as well as health centers. The UN Secretary General spokesperson also paid tribute to three soldiers from Senegal who died last week when their convoy was hit by explosive device. 
Ignatius Anno, VOA News, Washington. Concern about the long-term impact of Russia's war in Ukraine dominated discussions at the recent Munich Security Conference in Germany. The annual summit in Germany attracts heads of state, top diplomats, prominent military figures, as well as leaders in business and civil society. Lord Mark Malock brown is the president of the Open Society Foundations. He was at the Munich meeting and spoke to Heidi Adams, host of VOA Street Talk Africa. Today, we bring you part one of their conversation. Heidi began by asking Malak Brown about the main takeaways from the conference. Well, I think there was alarm, particularly in the corridors, less maybe in the public statements about the state of the war, a feeling that it was at a bit of a pivot point where it was less about the successes till now of Ukraine in containing and reversing Russian advances, and it was more about who had the better supply chain for be replenishing uh, their weapons supplies in a sense that both competents had real vulnerabilities in those supply chains, that the West was a little too cautious and slow in replenishing the Ukrainians and that the Russians were desperately searching uh, markets such as uh, Iran and China to see if they could secure uh, more resupply for themselves. So. You know, a war which had been about a slog for territory has become, in this phase, uh, a war about who can secure the best supply chains for rearming. Uh, what do you think year two of this war will reveal to us about Vladimir Putin? Um, what his thinking is, what his intentions are, and, and essentially what he sees as the end game in Ukraine? Well, I'm not sure we'll learn much more. I think his uh, stubbornness and the fact he's deep in a bunker of his own making is, is already pretty clear. But I don't think anybody should underestimate that stubbornness. He's going to, uh, you know, he sees it as strategic patience and that not for the first time uh, Russia, as the Soviet Union before it, will see off its opponents by just being willing to fight longer and harder than the other side. And whether it was Napoleon's armies or Hitler's armies, uh, Russian strategic patience and resilience uh, is something people underestimate at their own risk. So I think, you know, he, he's not going to give in. And the difficulty for Ukraine, a much smaller country, is how they force him to the negotiating table to enter into a peace agreement that will stick. It's quite possible there might be some ceasefire agreement to allow the two sides to rearm, but it needs a much more stable, deeper peace agreement than that. And it's still hard to see uh, the way to that, because Ukraine will want all its territory back. I think there's a question mark about the Crimea, but at the moment, Ukraine's claims are that too. Um, and on the Russian side, you know, they're not going to be satisfied without showing that this massive expenditure of Russian human life and, and economic capacity and the trashing of Russia's international reputation, uh, that there was some reward for that. So you've got two sides with completely conflicting uh, peace ambitions at this point. And that's always hard to try and make a peace when you have that disparity of, of objective still. It's a dangerous moment. It's a dangerous moment with a lot of risk on both sides. That was Lord Mark Malock Brown, president of the Open Society Foundations in New York, speaking to Heidi Adams, host of Straight Talk Africa. Be sure to watch part two of that interview tomorrow right here on Africa 54. The 28th edition of the Pan-African Film and Television Festival of Ouagadougou or FESPACO is a set, set, setting where film and media professionals meet to present their products and forge partnerships. We get more from VOS Thierry Kaure, Kaure and Yakuba Wedorago. VOS Salem Solomon narrates. The International African Cinema and Audiovisual Market, which began in 1983, is a premier event for the promotion of Pan-African cinema and a space where exchanges take place between producers, distributors, project leaders and broadcasters. We are on a roll for international co-productions and it is going in this direction that we have a lot of programs over the two years. 
it would be a question of doing a lot more training for producers to be able to go into the international market. At the festival, cinema and media professionals showcase their work on multiple stands. Aisha Widwago is a professional makeup artist and a member of the Association of Independent Cinema Technicians. I have been in the cinema industry for 22 years. I think I'm already very well known. On the set, I bring in girls to help me. Here, I also meet partners who want me to travel to do makeup in films. Promoting African films beyond the continent also involves distribution and professionals like Alan Modo. The advantage of the Mika workshop, of course, is that at least we see a lot of African producers and women directors who are always looking for distributors. They might not even know the size of the distributor. So our presence here is really useful. Television stations also send people to work in their on-site production studios and promote their broadcasts and sell their programs. The RTB is at the 28th edition of the International Film Festival to present its TV, radio and digital programs. We are here to also present our new baby, RTB Zenith, which is a new channel which will soon be on the bouquet and we are here to promote. The MICA workshop, also known as Atelier Yinega, is a space dedicated to supporting film projects and strengthening the role Pan-African film and television festivals of Ouagadougou or Fespaco could play. For Terry Kaure and Yakuba Wedrago from Ouagadougou, Salem Solomon, VOA News. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thank you for watching. In times of change, when the world seems uncertain, and what we hear doesn't reflect what we see, we seek the truth. When we are told only part of the story, we lose trust. In moments of crisis, our dreams, hopes, and wishes for a better tomorrow depend on a free press. At Voice of America, we bring you the stories that people take risks to see. We connect the world and unite it with truth. At Voice of America, we show you the whole picture.